I believe that a well-rounded education should include the in-depth study of the myriad artistic gifts offered to the world by Western civilization. That means understanding the difference between this and this. Like most folks educated in public school, although I was lucky enough to have a few professors that were particularly good at differentiating between masterpieces and garbage, I had plenty of teachers that legitimized postmodernist artists and put their works on par with the great masters. Teachers should focus prominently on the classics, but more generally on art that predates or includes the post-impressionist era. Of course, there are many notable exceptions that should be included in curriculum, but the focus should be on masterworks and developing a student's ability to identify what makes a piece of art beautiful, what makes it meaningful, what makes it interesting. I've done a few pieces on my channel about art, which I've linked below, and I'm always surprised by the number of comments in support of modern art and that claim that subjectivity precludes generating any beauty standards or even the ability to define what constitutes art. I get some variation of this comment on every similar video. Why should creativity be confined by artistic standards? And who has the right to set the universal standard for what is real art and what isn't? You seem to be trying to find objectivity in the subjective. Everyone has the right to critique art, but no one should be setting the standard of what is and isn't art. There are a few things wrong with this, so let's go to the heart of the argument. That beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It really isn't. In fact, there are numerous cross-cultural studies that show a universal consensus about what constitutes a beautiful face, for instance. This is from the New York Times archives and, as always, is linked below. In the latest study published in the current issue of the British journal Nature, both British and Japanese men and women ranked women's faces as most attractive when certain features associated with youthfulness like large eyes, high cheekbones, and a narrow jaw were exaggerated. Further, the study found Caucasians gave top ranking to the same Japanese faces that the Japanese preferred, leading the researchers to conclude in their report that there are greater similarities than differences in cross-cultural judgments of facial attractiveness. Clearly, we have an innate mechanism that sees a certain geometry of the face as beautiful and attributes to that face other characteristics seen as most fit. This makes sense since we want to choose mates with high levels of fertility and health, but what about our natural ability to recognize what we feel is comfortable and beautiful within nature? Many researchers believe that we are hardwired to recognize the golden ratio in faces and in nature. This is noted from an International Journal of Art study. Golden proportion or golden ratio is usually denoted by the Greek letter phi, which represents an irrational number. Because of its unique and mystifying properties, many researchers and mathematicians have studied the golden ratio, also known as golden section. Renaissance architects, artists, and designers also studied this interesting topic, documented and employed the golden section proportions in eminent works of artifacts, sculptures, paintings, and architecture. The golden proportion is considered the most pleasing to human visual sensation and is not limited to aesthetic beauty. Its existence can be found in the natural world through the body proportions of living beings, the growth patterns of many plants, insects, and also in the model of the enigmatic universe. The properties of golden section can be instituted in the pattern of mathematical series and geometric patterns. I often hear the argument that anything that moves you emotionally is, in fact, art. I disagree. I think art must aspire to be beautiful, to captivate the viewer, and to tell a larger story or embody a broader theme. Not only that, it needs to be done skillfully. But this concept of what art should be has been bastardized. Let's take a look at what modern, educated art snobs classify as art. Cheryl Haynes of Haynes Gallery in San Francisco says that art is clear intention, unwavering dedication, patience, perseverance, self-awareness, and the drive to make for yourself and no one else. The state of mind and the nature of the artist seem to be a theme in the art world prose commentary on what makes good art. And I encourage you to read all of these supposed experts commentary in the article below. Some are quite ridiculous. Jack Hanley, who owns a gallery in New York, similarly stated, I like something where the intensity of the experience of the person making it comes through. Maybe somebody is turned on by the nature of the materials, a psychological issue, or some kind of narrative. 
Maybe some people have greater intensities of experience than others. What makes art good on a grander scale is how extraordinary and profound the components of those experiences are. Some artists are maybe better than others at tapping into their own idiosyncrasies and conveying them to others. These comments in particular really embody the solipsism of modern art. There's a focus on the intention, on the process, and the artist's state of mind. And there is a complete disregard for the viewer. How a good piece of art unifies the audience through meaningful commentary about the human experience. It's all about the artist's expression an unrestrained outpouring of their own warped mind. And when there is concern about the elicitation of an emotional reaction, it's often manipulative, relying on shock value or grotesqueness in a feeble attempt for the artist to feel like their junk art is meaningful and powerful. The great artists, although some did achieve celebrity in their lives, were vessels for their art. Michelangelo famously said, I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free. Although he was something of a rock star in his era, he still understood that the art was enduring, the fame was not. His focus was not on his personal experience. It was on achieving divinity through the perfection of the form. He wanted to bring humanity closer to God. That isn't to say that personal experience has no place in art. Some of the most beautiful and moving pieces capture somewhat mundane, everyday moments that are reminiscent of the artist's personal experiences. But these move us because they reveal a greater truth about the fleeting nature of life, how it's ordinary yet extraordinary, and how capturing this very moment allows one small piece of a memory to endure through the ages, although we can never stop life from slipping through our fingers like grains of sand. We've lost this desire to capture ordinary moments and to leave a visual legacy. Perhaps we don't have the same fear of death or the same goals as a society. Perhaps we have just become too self-centered. I don't know, but what I do know is that something profound has been lost to us. So what is it really that makes a piece of art objectively good? As we discussed before, humans define visual beauty through a level of visceral satisfaction. Even though we may often not even know that we do it, we seek symmetry, complementary colors, correct perspective and proportions, and a balanced composition that draws our interest to a focal point, then works us through the rest of the piece. There must be a great attention to form, not necessarily capturing it as it is, but perhaps as it should be, opening the mind of the viewer to the very inhuman possibility of absolute perfection. To further illustrate these indicators of great artwork, let's take an in-depth look at a different masterwork that fulfills most of the criteria that we're discussing and a famous Fovist example that fails most of the same criteria. This is Botticelli's The Birth of Venus, painted in the mid-1480s. It shows the goddess Venus arriving at shore, following her birth, and emerging from the sea as a beautiful grown woman. This painting was somewhat unique in its subject matter. Most representations during the era were religious, and this is a traditional scene from Greek mythology. The eye is drawn to the focal point, the nude Venus, and travels down her body through the cream and peach colors to the shell, then up and over to the top of the rich cloak being used by another goddess to cover Venus. The eye then travels to the left to the wind god Zephyr, who blows on Venus to move her to shore. The movement of the wind is evident in the water, in her hair, and the direction of the other goddess's cloak and garments. I chose this painting not because it typifies all of the criteria that we're discussing. I chose it because it is beautiful, interesting, visually satisfying, despite having mythical subject matter and a composition that would never be seen in nature. It actually does not perfectly satisfy every single thing that makes a wonderful piece of art, yet it still is. She stands atop a shell, and in terms of perspective, if this was a truly realistic form, she would fall right off and faceplant. But her stance indicates the movement of her arriving on shore. It's an exaggeration. Similarly, her body is not completely true to the human form. It's elongated. Her hair is also highly exaggerated. 
Like Michelangelo, Botticelli sought not necessarily to capture reality exactly as it is, but to elevate it to something more divine, particularly in terms of the human form. He wanted to epitomize an unrealistic, unachievable, and godly concept of beauty. In terms of color, the greenish hues and creamy orange hues complement one another and really unify the piece thematically. There are contrasts, but there's a sense that all of the individual parts belong together. Although there are intentional perspective issues, it does not distract from the focal point of the painting. And the movement throughout and balance between the god and goddess on the left and the right respectively gives the viewer a sense of satisfaction, of equilibrium. It's obvious that Botticelli had mastered advanced painting techniques and that he had devoted himself to developing a personal style and perspective that demonstrated his high skill level. Although the subject matter of a painting should not be all about the artist, to be a great work, the artist must be central in a way in that they have to show a command of the medium. Now let's take a look at one of my least favorite artists, Matisse. Actually, I'll walk that back a bit because I quite like his earlier works. He showed great promise, but at some point in his career, like many other artists in the era, he became devoted to the ugly, to the off-putting. Eventually, this dissonance began to define his artistry. Perhaps his most famous painting is The Dance, painted in 1910, which is an exceptionally ugly work. His preliminary version of this 1910 painting, Dance One, is a more rudimentary version and has somehow achieved even more fame. But because this was not his final version of the piece, we'll discuss the 1910 dance. Like The Birth of Venus, I chose this not because it fails every criteria, but because it satisfies some and still is an ugly piece of art. Matisse became obsessed with primitive art, and this is evident in many of his works from the era. That's where this starts to go wrong for me, but we'll discuss subject matter in a bit. In terms of movement, this piece actually does satisfy most of the related criteria. There is very good movement and balance. The left and right side of the painting feel equally weighted, and the eye moves through the whole painting and around the circle of the five dancers, making the composition feel complete. That being said, I think it lacks a definitive focal point, even though the eye is eventually drawn to the two dancers whose hands are reaching for one another. The real problem I have with this piece is in the form. There's virtually no attention given to capturing a realistic form, and unlike the birth of Venus, the objective was not to elevate the form by diverging from reality. Here, he seems to want to capture the primitive, lackluster lines, bulbous, ugly bodies, and expressionless faces. Similarly, the treatment of color is flat, uninteresting, and amateurish, although I am aware that this was intentional, especially because of the high quality of his earlier works. The stark contrast of colors is unsettling, the blue against the green, and the oranges of these weird blob bodies. In terms of technique, let's be honest, a child could have painted this. I understand that this was a technique used to try to capture the tribalism and freeness of this dance, but technique is really what distinguishes good art from bad art. Expression isn't everything. That is, of course, part of it, but the defining factor is whether or not the artist has exhibited a true talent, a nearly unparalleled ability to depict a scene or image in an advanced style that has been actualized through a passionate devotion to the craft. Although the childlike style of the dance was intentional, there's no denying that a high level of artistic aptitude seems to be entirely absent here. Form, technique, perspective, talent, these are all very important aspects of what makes a great piece of art, but the subject matter is also very important. Great art connects us to one another. It shows us something true about the human condition, about the elements of our lives that we all share. It tells a story or brings us together to a higher place. Back to our examples, the birth of Venus, although it depicts a completely mythological scene, inspires awe in the viewer. It's so beautiful, an embodiment of absolute femininity manifested through nature and the human form. The viewer feels like the artist has captured something divine and feels grateful that it's expressed through lowly humanity, which is really the only thing that we understand. 
It isn't simple, so to say, but with continued viewing, it's pretty easy to tell a story about what is happening. With no knowledge of Greek mythology or art history, you can see that an unrealistically beautiful and feminine woman is washing ashore, being carried by the breath of a god. She seems to restrain her sexuality with a modest pose, covering herself with her hands and her long hair, and she's about to be cloaked, but she has no sense of shame on her face. And like we saw with Pollock, who purged all of his weird emotional energy onto the canvas without regard for the audience, that is another defining quality in good and bad art. The ability to practice restraint in technique, in form, and in subject matter. Let's go back to the Matisse painting, which completely lacks restraint. Unlike The Birth of Venus, which also has sexual themes, the dance is a celebration of primitive, unrestrained hedonism. And it's not just the subject matter that lacks restraint. He mirrors the unbridled hedonism of the dancers with uneven and careless brushstrokes. Although, once again, I am aware that this was intentional. Being consistent in theme and technique is not necessary to create a good piece of art. I fail to see why I should hold this piece to the high level of the masterworks if it displays none of the comparable technique or skill. And modern art has gotten so much worse than Matisse. Why? Why have works that show us nothing about humanity, that make us feel nothing, that capture no truth or beauty, been elevated to the level of Michelangelo? It's our societal sickness, it's postmodernism, our solipsism, the belief that the world ends at us, at our feelings, at our truth. If there's no universal truth, there is no universal beauty. And if there's no universal beauty, then the ugly can be revered. Thanks, folks, and I'll see you soon. Bye.